Well, I'm an actress and uh, I'm, I love this kind of work. Well, I guess maybe because I'm a woman first and because um, I did suffer from uh, adenomyosis and ended up with a hysterectomy a few years ago. So this became something I was very passionate about and I'm really honored to be here to host this. Thank you and welcome everybody. So, um, we've Hi, got guys. speakers. Thank Before you. I ask Dr. Abayomi to give us a welcome address, I'd, I'd like to introduce the speakers we have today. Okay. The speakers we have today on the launch of the African Endometriosis Foundation, and this is its first annual conference. So I'd like to speak about Dr. Rob. He's one of our speaker Dr. Robert Zurain is an associate professor in the division of gynecology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He received his medical degree with honors from Baylor College of Medicine in 1977 and completed his re residency at Baylor in 1982. Dr. Zurain served as chief of minimally invasive gynecologic and Baylor College of Medicine. He created the fellowship in minimally invasive surgery and the Fellowship in Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology at Baylor. Dr. Zurain specializes in minimally invasive surgery with particular interest in uterine fibroids, endometriosis, and alternative procedures to hysterectomy, as well as urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and is a recognized expert in robotic surgery. We also have Professor Isaac Folorinshaw Adewale, an oh. engineering professor of gynecology and obstetrics he was the former Nigerian Minister of Health from November 2015 to May 2019. He is a former Vice Chancellor of the University of Ibadan and President of the African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer. Prior to his appointment as the 11th Substantive Vice Chancellor of the University, he served as Provost at the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan, the largest and oldest medical school in Nigeria. His research interest is in the area of human papillomavirus, HIV, and gynecologic oncology, a specialized field of medicine that focuses on cancers of the female reproductive system, including ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, vaginal cancer, cervical cancer, and vulvar cancer. Professor Adewale is a member of the governing council of Adelike University and chairs the National Panel of Cervical Cancer Control Policy. He is the only Nigerian professor appointed as member of the Council of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. He was appointed to serve as a member of the International Advisory Board of the African Cancer Institute, a comprehensive cancer center in Sub-Saharan Africa. Professor Rotimi Iriti Akiola, is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and a current national president, Society of Gynecology and Obstetrics of Nigeria, Sogon, a consultant with the prestigious Lagos State University College of Medicine. Then we have Hans Rudolf Tinneberg, a founding member of the European Endometriosis League, EEL, whose main objectives are to extend public awareness and support scientific research in the field of endometriosis and other coexisting gynecological conditions. Dr. Hans Rudolf Tinneberg was the pioneer president of the European Endometriosis League from 2005 to 2012. He is currently the honorary chair of the organization which is at the forefront of endometriosis awareness and research in Europe. He has authored many publications on the subject matter. I hope I wasn't too fast. Mm -hmm. All right, then, um, thank you very much. And thank you for honoring us. And I'd like um, for Dr. Bayomi Ajayi to give us his welcome address. Thank you so much, Nse. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, endo advocates, the brave women who confront endometriosis every day, and all those who are affected by the unseen disease. It's a privilege and honor to welcome you to the launch of the African Endometriosis Awareness Foundation and the first annual conference. 
Um, I'm going to talk, be talking from the point of view of I experienced just a snapshot of my experience in the last couple of years with endometriosis. Um, as a young gynecologist, I've always been fascinated with the enigma. As you listen today, you will see why some people decide to call endometriosis an enigma of a disease because of the kind of ways that it's possible for it to present. And um, also when you are amongst people who also have experienced this, you know what I'm talking about. This disease was thought to be uncommon in black women. So there were very few publications in the past. But some outstanding publications were the ones by Equempo and Harrison in 1979, which looked at uh, endometriosis in Awusafula and women of Northern Nigeria. And then Olubu Ede and Adela in 1988. Very few publications compared to other subjects. I first, my first foray into endometriosis was in 1991 when I did a review of laparoscopic findings at the University College Hospital, Ibadan. And I also wrongly concluded then that endometriosis was not common in black women because my finding then was that it was only present in about 3% of women. But uh, looking back now, I know why it was like that because we're using, at that point in time, we're only using one single pot and we were not looking at where endometriosis actually usually is located, which is usually below the uterus. But that changed when we started the endoscopic unit of the Nordica Fertility Center in 2005. And because of that, we've started an annual program where we try to propagate endometriosis. And so since 2005, every year we've had a program to make sure that we talk about endometriosis to both the dogs and the lay public. Uh, because what we saw was that it was also important that patients, parents, employers of labor and women generally come to terms with this condition that know that is a very common condition in Nigeria. So we started with walks and then later on we went to the to, uh, balls and the uh, during that time, I came across some of the beautiful women that we are going to be talking today. Uh, for example, uh, the, if you, the picture I have there is that of the wife of the wife of Nigeria, and uh, Milen Magese, and uh, Nikki Okinawa, who was the, probably the first Nigerian to talk about endometriosis, is also in the picture. And then we have Kunfu from Botswana also in the picture somewhere there. And uh, maybe Rob will recognize uh, John Dulemba, who also was here a few years ago. So this, in, after we started this, we started in Nigeria since 2005. We started talking and then some, with some other people in Africa. And then late, sometimes last year, we decided we were going to have an African chapter. And uh, three of us were the first people who came together to move this idea. And you can see that Farida from uh, Ghana, She's going to give the vote of thanks. Uh, Mfo from Botswana is not feeling too great today, and so she might not be featuring this program. <coughs> but she was also one of the three people that we first started this uh, move. And um, I'm happy to say that seven countries actually are in the, uh, they are like pioneer members of this African endometriosis awareness and support group, um, Nigeria, Ghana, Botswana, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and South Africa. And you're going to meet some of the people also when they're going to be giving their own uh, good messages. The big question for the uninitiated is what is on endometriosis? And that's what I get asked so many times. Uh, well, now I remember a few years ago when about 2005, 2007, when we started with this annual lecture because we're doing annual lecture for endometriosis. And Majority of the people in the room could not even pronounce the word endometriosis. Most of the time, what they tell me is endo, endo something. But now I can see that a lot of people can really pronounce endometriosis. But the question, the big question is what is endometriosis? And it is the presence of cells which normally line the inner part of the uterus, which we call the endometrium, which a woman bleeds every month. Cells like this, when they occur in any other place apart from the normal place where they're supposed to be, is what we call endometriosis. 
And you can see from the picture there, the common places where they occur, on the ovaries, on the fallopian tubes, um, on the ligaments supporting the uterus. And then sometimes also they can occur in the muscle of the uterus. And so with which, uh, if you listen to what Inse was saying, that she had adenomyosis, which we call adenomyosis. Now, how common is this disease? Because we know that doctors tend to miss it a lot, not only in Nigeria, but all over the world. And it's a fairly unknown illness, but it's a very common illness. Actually, it's said to be present in about one in 10 of women in their reproductive age. And unlike what we thought before, we now know that endometriosis affects all races. Because of the fact that the awareness of endometriosis was very low a few years back, the month of March has been regarded worldwide as Endometriosis Awareness Month. Now, with about 200 million women and girls are affected with endometriosis. And the thing about endometriosis is that if you have somebody with endometriosis in your family, the whole family tends to be affected. Um, and there was a story of, a, I think, the first time I spoke publicly about endometriosis, and a woman came to meet me and she told me her story. And I was moved that she said her daughter, she has only one daughter, one day told the husband, said, look, dad, let's move out of Nigeria and leave mommy alone in Nigeria. And the father said, why is this so? She said, because mom is always sick. And so that is the, what women who have endometriosis go through. And Unfortunately, this affects women at the peak age of they're trying to conceive or they're trying to study or they're trying to make a career. So it tends to be early compassing how it affects women. The commonest symptom we know is pain. And this could be in form of painful periods. It could be pain that is not even related to periods at all. It could be pain during sexual intercourse. It could also be pain when passing stool. Most of the time, what gives this out is that this pain becomes worse during the time that a woman is menstruating. Sometimes also women, they have abnormal bleeding, which might either the, the menses is prolonged or is, uh, is irregular. And sometimes they also bleed from uh, abnormal sites. Right. Sometimes from the nose, from the operation scar, or from the operation wound. So it will, and that's why it's usually a nightmare for doctors to make this diagnosis. And also sometimes the infertility might just be the only complaint. We know that about 25 to 35% of infertile women have endometriosis. So when we compare to what I said in the 90s, that only 3% of infertile women had endometriosis, you see that this was a, 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 a terrible understatement. But we know also that 30 to 50% of women with, with endometriosis will have infertility. The thing sometimes that some women have no symptoms at all. And we, have, we saw that in about 11% of some of the patients that we have seen, that they had no symptoms at all. And you only picked up endometriosis because you are investigating them for infertility. So like I said earlier on, it tends to affect the well-being socially, mentally, and physically, and causes inability to work, to maintain a career, or go to school, or finish their education. And of course, also it affects relationships and social activities. It's been responsible, they're responsible for so many divorces because women probably cannot just consummate their marriages because of endometriosis. What, what is our experience like? What has our experience been in Nigeria? One of the things that we have seen, like most things, because of our healthcare structure, is that patients present late, even with endometriosis, coupled with the fact that sometimes also the physicians don't make this diagnosis early. What we have also seen is that majority of our patients, because they present, also pre present at very late stages of presentation. There's a poor understanding and delayed diagnosis, even among doctors. And then sometimes there is wrong diagnosis. It's not uncommon for some patients who have endometriosis to have been placed on anti-tuberculous drugs for about two years or so. When, actually that was my own wake up call. I had a patient like that that had been on anti tobacco drugs. And that was when, before even we started the um, 
before we started Medical Fertility Center. And that was one of the reasons why I decided I was going to be an apostle for endometriosis. So sometimes also we attribute problems of endometriosis to some other things and we're giving them empirical treatment. Many times we diagnose only just like I said, when patients present to, for infertility. These are some of the things that we have seen. We published some things on endometriosis. We looked at some representation where that's the, the chest x-ray of a woman who was coughing out blood and then we saw that it was from endometriosis. Um, this patient had also been placed on antitubacular drugs. The other picture is from a woman who has had a previous fibroid surgery and she was she kept bleeding from the scar of the fibroid surgery and uh, we've had experiences also where some people have been taken to prayer houses some people in this part of i remember it been one of the first cases where i saw in university college hospital that the patient was said to be a witch and was being taken from one prayer house to the other because she was bleeding from the navel so we've also published something we did uh, in 2016 we did a uh, 10 year study of endometriosis, which was published in the Journal of uh, Endometriosis and Pelvic Disorders. Uh, we, here we saw, we looked at 61 patients, but we have now an unpublished data, which actually we were supposed to present at the FIGO conference in uh, uh, um, Angola this year, which we could not go because of COVID, where we looked at 113 patients. And the funny thing was that the, most of the conclusions that we drew from the 61 patients were also true for the 113 patients. The mean age of presentation was about 33.3. Uh, the 86, about 87% of the women had not had children at all, showing that uh, infertility might just be one of the reasons why we see patients with uh, endometriosis. And then we saw that they started menstruating around 13 years, and then we saw that majority of them had moderate to severe endometriosis, about 67% of them. And um, uh, dysmenorrhea, or painful period, was the commonest symptoms. Only 13% of them had endometriosis in the first uh, relative, degree relative. But we know that most people don't even know what is happening to their mothers or their... So the medical issue is not something we share freely in Africa. So I'm not surprised that that's a little bit low. And 4.4% of them had frozen pelvis. One other thing we saw, because we are an IVF clinic, is that these people with endometriosis tend to have lower number of oocytes or eggs during IVF from stimulation, apart from the fact they have higher dosage of drugs than the other patients. But one thing also that we found was that there was no really significant difference in egg yield between minimal to mild endometriosis and severe to moderate endometriosis. But pregnancy rate was lower in patients with severe endometriosis. What we have done over the years is that we started using this, uh, which we are going to report in a scientific conference and for peer review, we, which is something that is also being recorded in the literature. We, what we're doing mostly for patients with endometriosis now, because we know that they have lower number of embryos, is to pull the embryos and defy embryo transfer. And this has yielded better results with some of our patients with endometriosis that are doing IVF. But on the front of advocacy, um, we have been doing a lot of advocacy. And uh, endometriosis support group Nigeria, which is part of the African endometriosis support group now, which, like I said, has been in existence since 2005. And every year we've been having this work that we we added a secondary school essay competition on endometriosis to this, where we go to, we, uh, go to secondary schools and ask the girls to write essays on endometriosis. And that we have done for about four years now, because we realize that this problem has to be tackled from the young girls and the, from teenage years. We also added the face of endometriosis to this. We, I think this is the third year running that we're doing this. Uh, the Mabel is the current uh, face of endometriosis. 2020, she will be the one to introduce the dance uh, when the endometriosis dance comes and she will be the one to do that. And then what we're trying to do with the advocacy is to let sufferers know that they are not alone and they need to encourage each other. They need to share ideas on how to cope. 
they have to spread the message and the knowledge we have realized that the knowledge about, about endometriosis is very poor in this area in this uh, environment and this is not only for with the lay people but also medical practitioners some of the things we are trying to pass along is that severe period is not no, severe menstrual period is not normal we are also like uh, Rob is going to be telling us about endometriosis in uh, adolescence that no one is too young to have endometriosis because most of the time this pain will have started at a young age and nobody does anything about it until she's in her 30s and she's, she's unable to have children. And we will also are letting people know that pregnancy does not cure endometriosis. And one thing again is that because some people don't want to talk about endometriosis because they think the moment you have endometriosis, that means you can't have children. And we know how the premium will place on children in this part of the world. That endometriosis does not equal infertility. The fact that you have endometriosis does not mean you have infertility. And we also tell people that you should not rush to remove your womb because hysterectomy does not cure endometriosis. And also to the doctors, we are telling them that endometriosis is a pathology. It is not an emotional state. So the fact that they tell patients that it's in their head hmm. should be there. And That's right. not a matter of that because you see some people, when they have menstrual pain, people think it's because they had an abortion. That, that's not the, the two of them are synonymous, are not synonymous. Well, we are not the Endometriosis Foundation, and we're having the first annual conference. This is a step towards improving the knowledge and awareness of this disease among women and their families and the general public, as well as among medical practitioners who care for this patient. We have seen that there is clearly a knowledge gap in Africa, and this needs to be filled. We will hear a lot of it's a few medical experts who will be speaking on endometriosis during this webinar, which promises to be worth your time. We hope to keep this going for years to come until hopefully we achieve a cure for this de debilitating condition. We are well, also welcome to join this foundation, and I thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Doctor. Um, that was quite an insight. Um, would like to ask Professor Akiola, the Sogon president, to speak on endometriosis in Africa as it is a burden we need to address. Thank you very much. Uh, and it is indeed my pleasure to be here uh, because uh, we have been involved for a couple of years now uh, at those um, are those events that Dr. Jai so eloquently spoke about. It's my great pleasure to be here this evening at the launch of the African Endometriosis Awareness and Support Group. And this is annual, first annual conference. At a time like this, when the world is focused on the COVID-19 pandemic, which has literally taken center stage around the globe, it is of great significance that this event is helping us bring to the fore a subject matter of great importance, which is very often underreported. Endometriosis, as we know, is believed to affect, and Dr. Jai says so, 10% of the world's female population. Hence, it's tagged as the condition of one out of 10 women globally. Now, Africa with a population of about 1.4 billion and the female population estimated to be about 51% of that, that translates generally to about uh, 70 million women suffering from this disease in the African sub-region. This figure is more than the population of some of the of most uh, African countries. And with the symptomatology of chronic pelvic pain, painful intercourse, very painful dysmenorrhea, painful menstruation, and infertility, and with its major impact on physical and mental and economic consider of quality of life, it is unconscionable to imagine that uh, research and development has remained so poor 
on this disease in Africa. For us as professionals and professional voice of women, women's health in Nigeria. We stand with the organizers of this event and the co-founders, especially Dr. Abayo Miajai, who has championed this course in Nigeria for the past 15 years. In my position as a president of the Society of Gynecology and Obstetrics of Nigeria, we are interested in extending our hand of fellowship to the African Endometriosis Awareness and Support Group to reach out to sufferers and professionals on the African continent. As we strive to find better ways of managing the condition amongst our women and girls. Of course, critical for us to consider is how we can fashion out an African response to the management of endometriosis. Dr. Ajayi has so dwelt on the paucity of research findings. You find out, for example, that a lot of the researches that we have have been uh, case reports, and uh, you find out that everybody believed that this is not common amongst Africans. And because it was believed that it was not common amongst Africans because uh, we falsely believed that, well, if you are not ovulating, if you are not uh, menstruating frequently, and of course, you know that uh, in the days of your African women were known not to menstruate often because first and foremost, they get pregnant very early. They breastfeed for long. They have multiple children. And because they do so, it simply means that they're in constant suppression. So basically speaking, but then things have changed. Our women now are not getting married early. Childbearing is being delayed much longer. We are no longer having as many children as we used to have. And incidentally, also truly, is the fact that basically we are not even having as many children as our parents had, which we thought had pro uh, protective effects. So what do we seek to address? The gaps we think we need to address with the, at this launch is that uh, the Africa Endometriosis Group, support group, should be considering information sharing among professionals. Endometriosis presents itself in different ways in different patients. Gathering data from different African countries may help us in understanding the condition better. We also can expand training opportunities by this collaboration for medical practitioners across the continent considering that some countries have had a longer history of success in managing the condition, you'll find out that our, our brethren in South Africa have had longer experience at uh, public, public, I mean, publishing and investigating and working in this field. And so it will be advantageous where doctors can access specialist training through this platform and to expand the knowledge base of our doctors on the continent. Again, another thing is that this serves as a develop, that we can develop a cross-reference platform. One of the advantages that has emerged from this COVID-19 pandemic is the growing use of technology in healthcare delivery. I just finished a, a council meeting of Society of Gynecology and Obstetrics in Nigeria about 10 minutes ago, and I can already see a lot of the participants on the platform here now. So we can attend so many different meetings at different intervals without actually shifting from one position. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we believe that the doctors on the continent can reach out to professional colleagues to review cases and help in proffering treatment options. We can expand our research capabilities. This is a clarion call to African medical and pharmaceutical professionals to collaborate more in the area of research and development, taking the best of Africa and creating solutions that can transform diagnostic and treatment regimes for us. I can safely say that with your intervention, we now do not say endo something. We now know that it is endometriosis, which is an achievement. I once, I once again thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to lend my voice 
and the weight of the Society of Gynecology and Obstetrics of Nigeria to the need to kick endometriosis out of Africa. I thank you very much for listening. You are muted. I apologize. Thank you so much, Professor Akiola, for that insightful conversation. And now we'd like to call on Professor Isaac Adewale, an endo champion in Nigeria, a former Minister of Health, an African response to endometriosis. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, forum, and I want to specifically appreciate the organizers for inviting me for, for, for the presentation. Um, I want to acknowledge the role of this African-wide initiative as an advocacy platform for addressing the problem of uh, endometriosis. I also want to thank Dr. Abayo Meajai, who has championed the effort over the past 14 years to the endometriosis uh, support group Nigeria. And I also want to thank all members of the endometriosis support group for improving knowledge and awareness within the Nigerian population. We have uh, had quite a lot about the issue on hand. And I want to say that endometriosis is a worldwide problem. And uh, it takes an average of 10 years to make the diagnosis. Uh, there's also the rule of 30, which Dr. Ajayi <coughs> mentioned. 30% of endometriosis, women with endometriosis have infertility, and 30% of women with infertility have endometriosis. And it's estimated that about 176 million women have endometriosis, and about 82% of them are unable to carry out their day-to-day -day activities due to endometriosis. And about one in 10 women will be affected during their reproductive years uh, period. But this is also essentially data from clinic setting. Uh, I will go on to talk about findings from population-based studies. We tend to indicate that endometriosis is uh, far rare in population-based studies than in clinic settings. Next slide. My slide is now moving. <clears throat> oh, okay, I'm, I'm done. This, this is uh, from a population based study. Uh, okay, now it's working. This is from a population based study. Uh, which actually indicated that the, the, the prevalence is rising. Uh, the incidence is also increasing over the years. Uh, it's published in BJOC in 2018. And uh, not only that, the cost is quite enormous. And uh, is, 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 a, is a cost of socioeconomic impairment. It causes pain. Everything you can think of concerning pain in women could be associated with endometriosis. And as stated by Dr. Ajay, it is truly an enigma. Pain on menses, pain on eating, pain on anything you can think of. And sometimes when you are stuck, just click on endometriosis. And you may not be too wrong. Uh, in Belgium, it's estimated that the cost will range to about 2.4 billion euros per annum to about 70.9 billion in USA uh, in terms of cost <coughs> to the society. When we also look at the breakdown um, from a study looking at the cost implication in the public library of science, uh, it shows that quite a lot of this cost is associated with productivity loss. Uh, about 84% is due to loss in productivity cost, about 12% to health cost, and 4% to care loss. And when you look at the breakdown, it is not just absenteeism that is responsible for loss in productivity. But a new concept in uh, workmanship engagement and uh, measurement also indicated that presenteeism is also a major cause for productivity loss in, in many of our cities. 
when we also look at the productivity loss, is more associated with severe endometriosis uh, compared to minimal or mild endometriosis. Uh, so there's some graduation in terms of the, the, the cost uh, due to productivity loss uh, compared to others uh, across the spectrum. What are the public health issues around endometriosis? One, there is the issue of the misconception that Professor uh, Akiola mentioned that Dr. Ajay also highlighted. There is a misconception that it is uncommon in black people, the black race. Uh, there, is, there are challenges with case definition in the community. There is lack of upgrade burden of disease in community, lack of community data to profile at risk group. Uh, there is challenges with information sharing and awareness creation, and there is need for investment in endometriosis, and there is need for collaboration across board. In a large uh, cohort study uh, in the community done in Israel, uh, published in BJOG, uh, it showed that endometriosis was present in 1% of the population. And this is quite similar to studies done in UK, in Italy, uh, and Germany showing that in, in the normal setting, in the community, endometriosis is, is, is about 1%. Compared to the 10% that uh, we've quoted so often in clinic-based setting. But even that, uh, 1% of the general population in the country like Nigeria could be huge. 1% of 200 million people uh, show clearly that we're, we're dealing with at least 2 million people in Nigeria. And if you are working with the clinic setting, 10%, uh, then you're talking about 20 million people. So the, the, the prevalence is between 2 and 20 million people in Nigeria. There's also the misconception about the cause of the pain. Um, do we have it more among married people? Do we have it among married population? The sexual dysfunction among couples, is it because the wife is trying to run away from sexual relationship? And the heterogeneity of social cultural interpretation is, is also a source of misconception. And there are different perceptions of endometriosis among different ethnic uh, people, in, in particularly in Nigeria. We also have challenges with case definition. There is wrong perception and belief that it is a disease of Caucasians, as I mentioned. There is poor awareness, lack of accurate information on its effect on reproduction. There is misconception, uh, particularly with respect to management and diagnosis. And we do not have data to support local definition, particularly where diagnostic facility is limited. We also need to generate community data to profile at risk group. And it is my belief that the endometriosis support group in Africa should lead a process of encouraging and supporting researchers to generate African-based data to back up our images. For example, how many girls in Africa are at risk of endometriosis? We also need to generate robust population level data that provide generalizable findings. We can also not be relating only on facility-based data alone. We need to look at sociological implications of endometriosis. We need to look at community interpretation of people with endometriosis. We need to look at cost of care, treatment, effect on family and community at large. We need to look at impact on sociological well-being, emotional well-being, and we need to look at genetic studies. These are all big influencers, and it is my belief that the endometriosis support group in Africa will at least work towards addressing some of this. We also need to share information, particularly about primary prevention, the role of health education, mass mobilization, involvement of community leaders, politicians, and parents. They need to engage uh, the girl child in advocacy efforts, uh, we, we need to incorporate endometriosis into sexuality education program. We also need to look at secondary prevention, early risking of at risk group, early refer to specialists uh, so that we do not just keep them at primary care centers and keep on moving from one first <coughs> diagnosis to the other. We also need to look at tertiary prevention. Early treatment by specialists is quite imperative. We need to look at capacity build and also facilitate public private partnership particularly with private sector organizations that are well endowed, uh, that are also, uh, that have the facility for making the diagnosis. We also need to invest in research. When you look at the number of publications, till date, um, we are asked to have about 3.3 thousand uh, publications from US, about well, over a thousand from UK, 
There are only about 83 from Africa. And in Nigeria, we have we can only record about 37 publications. And of these 37, only four were original research papers. So there is room for more research in Nigeria and in Africa to address this challenge. Uh, in terms of investment, we need to look at areas of investment. We need to make sure that uh, we expand advocacy, ensure that it is on track, put resources on research, build capacity for management, and also create biorepository bio facilities in order to really back up research into this field. What are the low hanging fruits for advocacy? One, we need to identify more champions. Uh, we need to engage critical stakeholders, the leadership of the African Union, the wives of our presidents and governors. Uh, wives have a way of reaching their husbands, and so we should use them. Legislators, particularly female legislators, corporate organizations, telecom industry, the banks, and messaging and supporting for research, engagement between private providers and teaching hospitals to ensure synergy in research and treatment, and also encourage formation of local support groups. And there's a lot we need to learn from the HIV support group program, where we, in fact, in a robust way, engage people who have HIV to reach out to other people who will not want to be identified. In my concluding remarks, I think we need to keep on drumming as an advocacy group. The endomyosis is real, and we need to change the narrative by using hardcore data to advocate and engage our stakeholders. Uh, advocacy is a long distance journey and requires resilience and sacrifice from everyone if we are to change the current narrative on endometriosis in Africa. We need to change empathy, create suitable platforms for people living with endometriosis to know and believe that is, that is hope. And endometriosis is not infertility as stated by Dr. Ajay. It is not death and it is not the end of the road. My pledge as an endo, endo champion is that based on my professional calling and previous assignment as a Minister of Health in Nigeria, I promise to offer my support on advocacy, lobby for support of other critical stakeholders and also have to mobilize resources in area of research and capacity building. I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adewale. Um, someone did mention that you did assume that all, um, after you made the statement that women can get across to their husbands, that you did assume that all presidents and governors would be men. So you should take back that assumption. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Okay, so um, this is getting even more interesting. We have with us here Njambi Kokai, who's an OAP in Kenya, and she has been living with endometriosis, so she's going to tell us about her experiences. Hello, Njambi. Njambi? Yes, yes. you're here. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, and um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me on this platform. My name is Jambi Koikai, I'm a media personality from Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, I am a thoracic endometriosis stage four survivor. I've been living with endometriosis for uh, 21 years. I got diagnosed in 2016, um, and I sought treatment at the Center for Endometriosis Care in Atlanta, Georgia. United States of America in 2018 after I was discovered to have stage four endo, uh, thoracic endometriosis that uh, the endometriosis had spread to my lungs and my diaphragm and uh, yes, and in my pelvic area as well. Um, I'd kindly like to read a paper written by Dr. Ken Sinabo, who's the medical director at the Center for Endometriosis Care on thoracic endometriosis. Is it as rare as once believed because uh, it has been presumed that uh, thoracic endometriosis is rare. Um, and this is one of the challenges I faced with diagnosis in my country because every time I went to the hospital, I was misdiagnosed for having tuberculosis. I was misdiagnosed for having pneumonia. Um, and thoracic endometriosis, I would like to say, is it's not, it's not rare. It's underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed. So thoracic endometriosis syndrome was proposed by Joseph and Son, 1996, and included clinical manifestations of thoracic endometriosis, mainly catamenial pneumothorax, hemothorax, hemothorax, I beg your pardon, hemotysis, lung nodules, chest pain, 
and pneumomediastinum. These conditions occur when endometriosis tissue, when the endometriosis tissue, which that is similar, but biochemically different than native, endometri native endometrium grows outside the uterus. And in this case, involves the diaphragm, thoracic cavity, or lung. Now, most patients with thoracic endometriosis present with some form of chest pain. They may have collapses both during and outside of the cycle. Chest pain, either chest or scapular pain seen over 90, uh, in over 90 patients. Um, coughing up blood, which is also one of, uh, mm, you know, one of the, the collection of fluid into the chest, hydro or hemothorax that are not cancer related. The reason for patients experiencing upper chest pain usually has less to do with where the endometriosis is located mm -hmm. as with innervation of the diaphragm. Now, I'd like to explain um, my experience with thoracic endometriosis and what this paper is talking about. I went through um, a period where, uh, or basically I would have, during my menstrual cycle, I would start coughing a very dry, endless cough. I would have chest pain that would emanate from my shoulders, moving all the way to my ribs and to my diaphragm. I would not be able to lift my hands up. I would not be able to walk. I would not be able to stand. I wasn't able to sit. And that would mean that that was the onset of my lung collapses. So every month while I was on my period, my lungs would collapse. They collapsed 21 times and I've been through 21 surgeries. And what that basically meant that meant was every time um, my lungs collapsed. I would have to go in for a surgery. Or when I when I would have a lung collapse, they would have to push in a tube, a chest tube, to drain out the fluid, and that was not treating it. That was basically managing the symptoms. And so, what would happen after I left hospital was during my lungs. What I found out about the Center for Endometriosis Care, fusion, and that is the only gold standard. Uh, of treatment for endometriosis, which is excision, which means basically cutting out the disease from its root. But unfortunately, we do not have excision specialists in Africa, and that is a great challenge for African women facing endometriosis or battling endometriosis. And I would also like to say that um, we should, as, as, as we are advocating uh, for this disease and raising awareness, we should also advocate it as a full body disease. This disease affected my lungs, it affected my diaphragm, it affected my ribs, they had to cut up um, my appendix. They, they also found water in uh, my stomach, which they had to drain out. And I, fortunately, I did not have to go through a bowel resection. Um, I also had to go to an orthodontist surgeon because they found very high levels of estrogen in my gums and teeth. So they had to cut out part of my gum, remove about four teeth, uh, and these are symptoms that are constantly ignored by gynecologists or by our doctors. When women present these symptoms to the, the doctors and say, when I brush my teeth during my period, my teeth bleed. That, that is one of the symptoms that's ignored. Or when I'm coughing during my period, or if I have severe pain, you know, that's emanating from my foot all the way to my thighs. Those are symptoms that should warrant us to advocate for endometriosis as a full body disease that requires a multidisciplinary, um, you know, it requires a multidisciplinary force in order to treat it. In this case, um, when I was, when I, when I sought um, specialized treatment, uh, during my surgery, there was a cardiothoracic surgeon who is experienced in excision of um, endometriosis in the lungs there was the gynecologist, the obstetrician gynecologist who is experienced in, um, in, in uh, uh, you know, excision of, of the endometriosis in the pelvic area. I also had to go to a cardiologist because there was evidence of estrogen aligning my heart. And that is also another symptom. So we, we, should, we, should, we should view endometriosis as a full body disease. It is very expensive to treat. And I do hope that we will continue raising awareness on this disease in order for our governments to also involve insurance companies to have a policy that will cover endometriosis patients, not to look at us as risks because we are considered very high risk patients. I had to, you know, I had to fundraise, I had to carry out a nationwide uh, fundraising campaign in my country for me to seek specialized treatment in America. 
And this treatment is way out of league for very many women. You know, so we have to think about that. We have to think about the cost. We have to think about how endometriosis impoverishes women because if we are constantly in hospital, we're not able to work. We are all, we are, we're constantly asking for leave days. You know, we're not being productive because of the pain. So we have to also think about those things and how we're going to work with the government in order to cushion women who are battling endometriosis. Um, and I also feel that if I had been diagnosed at the age of 13, I would not have had an advanced stage of endometriosis like I did. Um, I started menstruating when I was 13 years old. And from the onset of my, uh, my period, I have never had a painless period. And, it, and 16 years later, after I started menstruating, you know, um, the evidence of the disease is that it keeps spreading as, as years goes, go by because from the ages of 13, if I had been diagnosed earlier, I would not have had endometriosis in my lungs. I would not have had endometriosis in my diaphragm. Now, this has caused me a lot of great, great, great damage because, um, you know, lung disease is not something that you can heal in a month. It takes years to heal. And considering that I'd gone through so many botched surgeries, um, you know, it will take time for me to heal. And so this, we also need to advocate for, you know, uh, doctors training, early doctors, I mean, doctors training so that we can be able to have early detection of the disease. And because we also understand the challenges of the mutation of the disease as years goes by, you know, as years go by. So we also need to uh, definitely, um, you know, advocate for training so that we can have early detection and more doctors to get trained so that we can have um, availability and accessibility of quality healthcare in Africa. Um, and I also feel that we also need to engage, like I said, it's a full body disease. That means that we also have to engage with mental health experts, considering that with this disease, the medication that is involved is quite heavy even during recovery. And most of us have developed post-traumatic stress disorder, something that is also ignored by, you know, the medical health practitioners and the doctors as well. So like I said, this is an all round, um, it, it's an all round disease that needs all round specialized care. And it is a challenge, but I believe with all of us coming together, we will definitely, definitely come together to raise awareness. And, uh, you know, we just, we, we have to keep spreading the information and sharing it as much as possible. Um, I'm doing well currently. I do not have endometriosis. I'm healing from it. They cut it out. They cut it all out. I. I'm battling adenomyosis, which I'm also under, you know, um, medication for, but I'm, I'm doing really, really, really well. And I thank everybody uh, for, you know, all the support. And I also thank you all for having me on this platform to share my story. I believe as we continue sharing our story, we are also helping other women who are battling endometriosis. It's not the end of the world. There's hope. I survived 21 surgeries and I'm alive today to share my story and to give hope to the African woman who's battling um, this monster. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And God bless each of you. Yes, thank you so much, Njambe. Um, your story was truly touching. And I, I say if I speak for everybody that we're very grateful to hear your story, share your journey with you and see you've come out at the end of the tunnel strong and you're speaking to other women and advocating. And what we take from your, your speech or your story is that we must treat endometriosis as a full body disease. Mm -hmm. We can't, you know, take out one part because it would affect every every part of your body as a woman. And then we must also advocate for young um, health um, health instructors to understand that there's so many signs to this. And then we mustn't kick other things to the curb. We must check them and be sure before we go ahead with diagnosis. Thank you so much, Jambe. So um, would like to call on Professor Rob. Zorawin is a former president, Society of Laparoscopic Surgeons, the president and CEO, Texas Institute for Gynecologic Research and Education. He'll be speaking on endometriosis in adolescents. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, um, I'm just gonna load myself up here. I think what we say is, is this uh, Barca de Rana? Is that how you say it? To uh, good afternoon. Is that it? Can you hear me okay? Speaking. We've got okay. so many languages here. There you are. Can you hear me okay? Very good. Najee. What's that? 
Nancy, what did you say? I didn't hear your last thing. Oh, okay, you're laughing now. Yes, I'm uh, laughing. <laughs> okay, um, so it's a privilege to be here. And uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ajayi, uh, who uh, recently invited me to uh, Nigeria several years ago to participate in one of the early pro programs, and it was a great honor. And um, I'd like you to uh, uh, follow up, and I want to thank all of the other panelists for their input, not only the doctors, but the women who have experienced endometriosis, and for the awareness in Africa for the uh, disease of endometriosis. So one of the most important things that I want to share with the group today is um, actually the most important part, which is the early diagnosis. Because the women who have shared their stories from thoracic endometriosis to crippling endometriosis to infertility, um, all of them have already been diagnosed at a very late stage of the illness. They've already uh, experienced crippling complications that required extensive surgery. Now, for many years, I've been the, ch the chief of the gynecology service at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas, which is the largest children's hospital in the world. And it was a great honor, but one of my uh, 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 duties and research interests, besides um, congenital abnormalities and teenage health in, in girls, was endometriosis. And uh, I worked very hard in awareness in the uh, early diagnosis of endometriosis when it can be treated much better. So endometriosis uh, does affect 15% of reproductive aged women and 70% of women with chronic pelvic pain. But 66% of adult women report onset of symptoms before the age of 20. And it, it's the kind of condition where if you look for it, you will find it. But if you don't think of the diagnosis, you won't make the diagnosis. So I'm gonna speak with you now this afternoon about how to suspect endometriosis and how to treat it. Also, not only that, but considering the availability or sometimes the limited availability of surgery like laparoscopy, how to treat it um, without even laparoscopy. So let's, um, let me just see, there we go. Now, um, this uh, goes all the way back many, many years to Professor uh, Rokotansky. And uh, this is actually in 1860, where he first described endometriosis. And uh, that is the earliest known um, endometriosis, but it was diagnosed uh, in women who had infertility and pain, and uh, it, it laid dormant for maybe almost 100 years, well, 60 years. The theories of how endometriosis forms is very interesting because nobody still in 2020 knows exactly the pathophysiology of endometriosis. Uh, Dr. Sampson in 1921 postulated that menstruation, menstrual fluid backed up through the uterus out the fallopian tubes and implanted into the uh, peritoneal cavity, and that was uh, retrograde menstruation. Uh, Samson and then uh, 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 Meyer formulated coelomic metaplasia, which is the, the uh, tissue of the peritoneal cavity, changed from peritoneal epithelium to endometriosis. Lymphatic metastasia, vascular metastases, uh, which would explain, of course, the thoracic endometriosis, because you can't have retrograde menstruation causing endometriosis in the lungs or in the, in the under, under the diaphragm. Um, we know already, as Dr. Ajayi talked about iatrogenic dissemination, which is in, this, in, in the abdominal scars of cesarean sections or uh, laparoscopic trocars, and then cell-mediated or immunological defects. So here is Dr. John Sampson's first report in 1921, and he noted chocolate cysts of the ovary. And uh, these are, uh, again, the earliest uh, American or, uh, reports of endometriosis. So one of the things that we're realizing now is that the body has a defective immune surveillance, that it cannot recognize tissue or cells that don't belong where they are. Uh, so that normally, if endometrial cells do go retrograde into the peritoneal cavity, um, they would be absorbed or removed or phagocytosis. And uh, in the case of endometriosis, that doesn't happen. Um, 
And here you see the secretory products of peritoneal macrophages, uh, will, will the cytokines, TNF alpha interleukin and chemokines, uh, stimulate neovascularization. In other words, the endometrial cells um, uh, irritate or stimulate a, a, a reaction in the peritoneal uh, cells and transform them or encourage the growth of endometriosis. Uh, now, what is uh, key here is premenarchal endometriosis. So there have been reports of five premenarchal girls, you know, this before menses with chronic pelvic pain, no uterine anomalies, negative GI evaluation. All of them have laparoscopically biopsy proven endometriosis and ablative treatment. Uh, one of the things that I'll see very commonly, of course, because of, I have a very large referral practice is uh, you remember the second bullet point, no uterine anomalies. Well, we will see endometriosis in women with vaginal agenesis or transverse vagin vaginal septum because there is no escape of the menstrual fluid and it does back up into the peritoneal cavity. However, in those cases, once we correct the uterine anomaly, the endometriosis goes away in most of those cases. So if it were purely retrograde menstruation, we would have imagined that this would be just terrible endometriosis. But again, something happens in the body's reaction uh, to the cells that makes it proliferate. There's a wide range of incidence of, endomet of, of endometriosis in adolescence, depending on the studies. These are older studies, but uh, you can range from 25 to 70% of adolescents with pelvic pain uh, have endometriosis. But the key here is the second bullet point, which says, uh, oral contraceptives and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, uh, drugs, because one of the algorithms that everybody should follow, whether they do surgery or not, is this. If you have an adolescent who has chronic pelvic pain, and I'll describe to you the manifestations of it, not just dysmenorrhea, but if you have these manifestations of chronic pelvic pain, you should give them a three-month trial of oral contraceptives and non-steroidals. If they get better, then you continue on them and they don't need surgery. If they do not respond to three months of oral contraceptives and non-steroidals, then they should have a laparoscopy. And you'll be amazed when I show you how many of these adolescents do end up having endometriosis. And here's a study by my good friend, Mark Laufer, who's in Boston Children's Hospital still. <laughs> and uh, this was done 20, over 20, maybe 23 years ago. Uh, and here you'll see that if you give women, uh, girls um, three months of oral contraceptives and um, non-steroidals for three months and they fail and you do laparoscopy, 67% of them will have visible endometriosis, 23% will have adhesions, some will have grossly normal pelvis, functional cysts and so on. But the key number is here, is that endometriosis in girls who have failed conservative medical appropriate therapy will have endometriosis. This is Mary Will Balwig who, uh, a number of years ago, also described the age at first onset. And look at this over here, under 15, 38% of them uh, in one of the true registries of 4,000 girls had endometriosis under the below the age of 15. I've seen it certainly in that age group. The symptoms in adolescence can be cyclic pain or non-cyclic pain. Mo all of them had dysmenorrhea, but two thirds of them had GI symptoms uh, non-specific abdominal pain and referred pain. So what happens when a girl has just abnormal uh, GI symptoms, uh, uh, nausea, constipation, distress? Well, we have something at Texas Children's Hospital that we call TBP, which is teenage belly pain. And all of you who have been women or have daughters who are teenagers know that anything will set these girls off to have abdominal pain doing badly in school, a girlfriend that calls her a, 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 a bad name, a boyfriend that they break up with, they'll get belly pain. So do all of these women, all these girls have endometriosis? No. But what happens with these girls is they get referred to GI doctors or psychologists or psychiatrists or internists, and they'll have uh, uh, GI workups and they end up having endometriosis. So this is the awareness that I'd like to bring up to you. Here's the most common symptoms. Again, pain at menses, 96%, but you'll see fatigue and exhaustion, diarrhea, painful bowel movements or other uh, uh, intestinal upsets at the time of periods, bloating, irregular bleeding, pain after sex. Well, that's not much when you're 14, but still it's there. And then 
uh, uh, nausea and stomach upset. So again, you have a variety of symptoms. The key is to get them diagnosed. Well, let's say you do decide to do laparoscopy. That's the other big challenge because most of the cases that I see as referral have had laparoscopy. They're not better. They get sent to me because they don't know what to do next. And so when I do the laparoscopy, I'll find the endometriosis because the original surgeon didn't know how to recognize it by its appearance. It can appear many different ways in red or pigmented or like the, what they call the gunmetal blue uh, is the most common, but it can be clear in vesicles or white or superficial. And I'll show you some of these. Not only that, but everybody thinks that it should be in the cul-de-sac or either sacral ligaments, but it can be in the broad ligament, it can be in the ovary or the rectum or the perineal pockets. And um, so we have to uh, look for that. Deep infiltrating endometriosis is one of the most difficult cases that we have to uh, deal with. And I'll talk about that briefly later. So again, in adolescence, the implants that we see are not typical of what's seen in adults. Adolescents have clear vesicles, almost like blisters or herpes, white implants or sore, small hemorrhagic or petechial spots. And if you biopsy these, they will have endometriosis. If you biopsy normal appearing peritoneum, you will occasionally find endometriosis. So here is a variety of findings. Of course, in the upper left is endometriosis here, a classical blue-black finding here along the peritoneum, here in their uterus sacral ligaments, the most common finding. But here you'll see it in adhesions. This just looks like an adhesion with a scar on the bottom left, and that's endometriosis. So let's look at some of the more common ones and why it looks like that. Well, when it first proliferates and attaches, you'll get red from proliferation and, and partial shedding. But then with neovascularization, then it will become black and inflammatory with fibrosis, and then it becomes white. Here's a cul-de-sac piece of uh, endometriosis with like just a little, little blip of, of brown endometriosis there. Here is what the biopsy of that showed, glands and stroma. Look at this, you'd have to look very hard. Here actually is the light reflex of the laparoscope uh, bouncing off this little blister. Boom, endometriosis there, a bullous lesion. Here is Allen Masters syndrome. Allen hyphen Masters, that's actually one person, but in Britain, they often have uh, hyphenated names. And this is scarring caused by retraction of the inflammatory process of endometriosis. This is the uterosacral ligament, and there is the peritoneal window. Now, the key to endometriosis, and one of my, my passionate feelings about the treatment of endometriosis is the people who just see a little uh, a dark spot of endometriosis, and they take a laser and they laser it, or they'll take a little bipolar and they'll, they'll, they'll burn it. And that never works because um, endometriosis is like uh, an iceberg, the kind that sank the Titanic which is that what you see on the surface is the visible endometriosis, but in many cases, it's what lies underneath. That was a, a good horror movie, by the way, if you haven't seen that movie in the theaters, uh, what lies beneath. So here, the depth of infiltration um, can vary, okay? But 25 to 48% of lesions are greater than five millimeters deep. Now, typical lasers don't go five millimeters, Okay, and you need to excise lesions. I excise everything because first of all, I want a pathological diagnosis and confirmation. But second of all, I want to adequately remove it to its complete depth. Here's another little lesion. It looks like a little, little streak of blood, endometriosis, all there also. Now here's one of my favorite patients. She was uh, 14 years old, had chronic pelvic pain, and um, it looks pretty normal, doesn't it? So I'm challenging you to see where's the endometriosis in this young girl. And if you look carefully, it is there. And when you go close up, that's what it looks like. Biopsy proven endometriosis. Okay. And you have to know there is, look at this, these little tiny little vesicles right there and there, endometriosis there. And here's again, vesicular bullous endometriosis. If you don't know what you're looking at, you won't make the diagnosis. All these spots. So what is the management? Well, of course, there's 
uh, conservative surgical treatment because we certainly want to preserve the fertility of all these young women. And of course, if they have a correction, a, a Mullerian anomaly like uh, uh, vaginal agenesis or transverse vaginal septum, or even the um, uh, uh, hemi vagina with uh, ipsilateral renal agenesis, one of my favorite, which you don't see very much, I see a lot of it. You want to fix that, they get better. Medical treatment, as we talked about, are going to be um, non steroidals, contraceptives, progestins, uh, GnRH agonists. Um, uh, and uh, progestin your intrauterine devices. This is an excellent one over here. The Mirena intrauterine device for adolescents works great in many cases. Combination in surgical and medical management. So here's the issue. Uh, patients will tell me, doctors kept telling me I was normal. It's terrible to watch your child in pain and feel completely helpless to her. And I was, uh, this other one said, I was evaluated for lactose intolerance, Crohn's disease, sexual abuse, sexually transmitted diseases, everything except endometriosis. So this is what you'll see. And here's my studies that I'll show you that. Here, um, endometriosis is progressive and the prevalence and severity increases with age. And the goals of early diagnosis are to decrease morbidity and most importantly, limit the progression of the disease so that it never reaches the point where their fertility and their uh, is compromised. And then the only uh, solution for them is major, major surgery. Uh, and of course, these are very well-known uh, pioneers in endometriosis surgery, Philippe Koenigs and so on. So um, if we looked at the di and prevalence of endometriosis and the time to diagnosis and the referral patterns, I wanted you to point out this to you. This was a brief study of a small study a number of years ago where they had several patients ages nine to 21 with pelvic pain, no radiologic evidence of disease who underwent laparoscopy. So there were 39 adolescents, 25 patients met the inclusive criteria and 100% of those patients were found to have endometriosis. Most in stage one, but occasionally 12% of them in stage three, biopsy proven, uh, surgically diagnosed. The mean age was 17.2 years and the mean BMI was 23. So these are not obese girls. They were thin and they had menarche at 12.2 years. Well, almost all of them had uh, abnormal bleeding. Most of them had cyclic pain, but look at all these ones that had GI symptoms, 68%, 48%. The time from onset of symptoms to diagnosis was 22.8 months. This is what the tragedy of endometriosis and you'll see it a lot in the United States, Europe, Australia, Asia, Africa, is that you, they don't know what they're looking at. And look at that. Some of them on the outliers are 132 months. So it's almost 10 years. The average number of physicians seen for the evaluation of pelvic pain was 2.7. Sometimes it was five or six. I've seen up to that many, 12 doctors who have seen them without a diagnosis. So patients who were prior to refer to my practice 60% saw one or more gynecologists, gynecologists, 36% saw a gastroenterologist, some of them saw an internist, a urologist, a general surgeon, uh, everything, even orthopedics and psychiatry. 40% reported more than one emergency room visit. So these are some of the diagnoses, pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, TB, TBP, teenage belly pain, 12%. Ovarian cysts, Crohn's disease, appendicitis, orthopedics, everything. I, I think I've made my point fairly clearly. So the results are the, the need for the right diagnosis by the right doctors. 12% uh, of girls had a previous provisional diagnosis of endometriosis, but they weren't treated for it. And so um, that's the key here. 67% um, of the girls referred to our center by a physician. The remainder were referred by family or friends. And after laparoscopy, 84% described a satisfactory income outcome. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of these, but this is another uh, confirmatory study showing uh, early diagnosis. So really, my last slide is just the conclusions that I'd like to emphasize to all of my friends all over Africa. Uh, and uh, that is that adolescents with pelvic pain and no other radiologic evidence of pathology have, have a high rate of endometriosis. The incorrect diagnosis will continue to result in delays, and it should be considered in adolescence as a primary diagnosis. Now, when you can't do laparoscopy, again, I take you back to the um, 
previous study, which is it's entirely reasonable and recommended that you uh, give these uh, girls three month treatment of, uh, and, of uh, oral contraceptives and non-steroidals. And if that uh, does not work, then laparoscopy is indicated. But some of the other things that you can do actually is, and here it is, rule out non-gynecologic causes, oral contraceptives and NSAIDs. But what you can do as well, and is you can give them a GnRH agonist if that's uh, uh, acceptable, repeat the trial, but then if it's continued pain, then you need to resect it. One of the things that I like is, um, uh, is norethindrone acetate added to Lupron. Uh, I know that's a, comp a difficult drug to get, but if, uh, if you give a 16-year-old or 18-year-old Lupron, you need to supplement with them calcium and vitamin D and norethindrone acetate five milligrams a day um, because you want to prevent uh, osteoporosis or other problems with uh, luprolyte therapy. Other things are the uh, selective progesterone receptor modulator. Eulopristal was approved in Europe, but it's, it's having some issues with it now. It was not allowed in the United States. Here is the intrauterine contraceptive systems that I like. They're both made by the same company, Mirena and Skyla. Now, if, when I was a young doctor, uh, probably in the days of Hippocrates, uh, we, we weren't using IUDs in adolescence because we were concerned about infertility and pelvic inflammatory disease. But now we find, especially in, in girls who are not reliable to take pills or patches or other things, that actually the IUD is an excellent alternative and the uh, progestin-containing intrauterine contraceptive systems are an excellent alternative for the treatment of endometriosis. Here's another study on treatment with the Mirena IUD, and these are 34 women with an 85% continuation rate. Some of them had side effects. Okay, but actually it was a, a good, and I'm gonna skip some of these because it's too many slides. Um, these are the uh, treatments like with Eula Crystal, Mirena and angiogenesis. Uh, uh, this is uh, something for you to consider. Again, in Africa, uh, as in the United States, we have many areas where laparoscopy and advanced treatment is not available. So I wanted to present you with some of the medical therapies that are proven and helpful uh, in cases where you can't do the surgical therapy. Uh, I told you about Mullerian obstruction and uh, imperforate hymen, transverse vaginal septum, functional non-communicating uterine horn. Uh, in, my, in my practice, I do an MRI in these patients. Uh, ultrasound is not enough, and actually a combination of MRI and laparoscopy is indicated. These are rare, but they will cause that. Um, I did want to mention to you that um, I'm, I, for those who have not been to the United States or not there recently, but of course we are battling uh, the same problems you are with COVID. And uh, Houston, where I live, is one of the uh, most highly affected uh, cities in the United States now for uh, COVID. And uh, so we hope that everybody stays safe. Um, I have traveled to many, many countries in Africa over the years. Of course, Nigeria and Ethiopia and Kenya and South Africa and Zimbabwe and uh, Egypt. And you, you can name and I've been there. And I very much uh, appreciate working with my many good friends and colleagues in Africa. Uh, and I hope that we can get to the point where we can all travel and visit each other again and share our experiences. In the meantime, I certainly would be happy and willing to uh, offer my uh, services for consultation. And uh, thank you very much for uh, offering uh, to invite me to this lecture. Many, many thanks to uh, Dr. Yomi Ajayi who is a, a international leader in endometriosis and surgery and infertility in uh, the Nordica Center, which I've had the pleasure of visiting. And uh, also that terrific fashion show that we had a couple of years ago. And uh, that was the best. And although they all had women's uh, uh, fashions, I needed something, all I have is this suit, Yomi. I need something better than this. But uh, thank you all for your very kind uh, uh, invitation. I look forward to all of you soon. To seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rob. Um, that's an Welcome. insightful um, presentation and it's taken us back to being careful in diagnosing our kids, the adolescents. We need to realize that they too can be affected and so we all have to be more careful in checking that these are the right things to do. Thank you so much. I think um, I've been told that we're running out of time but um, Sorry. So now to have a second presentation, um, we have 
Professor Hans Rudolf Steinberg, the President of the European Endometriosis League, and he'll be speaking about the treatment challenges in endometriosis. Thank you so much for honoring us. Well, thank you very much for having me on this program. I'm deeply impressed by the presentations, especially from Africa, of course, also from, uh, from Houston. And I hope you can see my screen now. Okay, fine. So um, I'm, I'm not speaking so much about treatment uh, challenges, but of course, uh, if you like, I can touch. Um, what, I, what I would like to say, first of all, is um, I agree with every speaker that was speaking uh, before me. Uh, and uh, I am deeply moved by what Jambi was uh, reporting because it underlines the dilemma uh, that uh, patients with endometriosis are exposed to. And uh, most of all, this is um, an intercontinental problem. This is not only in Africa, this is everywhere because the main problem with endometriosis is ignorance of those that are not affected because um, women that have this disease, they, they doubt their own psyche because they have this pain, but everybody else says, we can't find anything, there shouldn't be anything. Now, um, uh, we know that, uh, that this is the spectrum and uh, um, in uh, continuation of what uh, Robert was just explaining, you can see nearly 20%, one fifth of all uh, women um, affected, they are adolescents. So this is an important group. <clears throat> and uh, I know from Germany that uh, when a young girl is reporting about uh, pain during menses, uh, mostly mothers will say, this is normal, I have the same problem. And uh, therefore it is uh, uh, negated. <clears throat> and uh, also uh, perhaps in continuation of what uh, Robert was uh, explaining, there is a very interesting study by Charles Chapron from Paris that uh, uh, when these young girls are given uh, oral contraceptives, they usually are uh, losing their pain but later on, they will present with a higher degree of uh, deep in, uh, infiltrating endometriosis, which is also something that we would like to <clears throat> uh, avoid. Now, uh, when someone is presenting uh, uh, to you as a doctor or as uh, a family member, um, there are four Ds that have to be asked. First is dysmenorrhea, which is painful menses. Mm -hmm. Dyspareunia, pain during intercourse dysuria, pain during voiding. And this is very, very important because a lot of um, uh, women that, that cause, that um, complain about dysuria, they are diagnosed to have an inflammation of uh, the bladder and they will be given antibiotics, but that does not help in the long end. And dyskesia, which is painful passing of stool. And of course, it is also important to ask, when does it begin, before or during menses? Is there radiation of pain and uh, is there allodynia? That is, are there areas that, uh, that uh, react uh, painful? And uh, perhaps this also has to be tested. We know that there is a different incidence and uh, it is, unfortunately, it is less common in uh, smoking women because I, I'm advocating uh, women and also men to, to skip uh, smoking, but also during physical activity. And of course, um, if uh, women start having children early in life and having many children, that is something that I've seen also in, uh, in Arabian countries that there is a little less uh, endometriosis than in other countries. However, it is more common in women with uh, short cycles, uh, positive family history, tall, slim women, Asian women. I have very little experience with um, African women, but red-haired women have a higher incidence. Uh, it is also said that um, uh, women that are pedantic have a higher incidence of endometriosis. And of course, uh, in case of infertility, uh, women are more likely to experience endometriosis. 
Now, when a woman or uh, an adolescent presents to the gynecologist, there are certain ways that have to be done. And first is the anamnesis, which we discussed, but also there has to be an inspection and the inspection should always be performed with a, a septate speculum, not with one that opens uh, like this, we, we call it uh, a duck uh, um, a beak, but um, uh, only this way one can inspect the posterior fornix and also a, uh, a palpation, which is a recto, uh, recto vaginal palpation has to be done. This is not very nice for, for patients. It's also not very nice for the gynecologist because you, you will touch stool and will take this out. But this is absolutely important because then you will reach tender points here. This is one of the, 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 the most common areas where endometriosis might develop and was also shown in the slides of Robert, but you can feel it. And if you touch this area, then the patient will lift uh, from, from the examination chair and uh, it will tell you this is painful. And then you have already the trigger point where to do. Of course, imaging is very important. Uh, MRI, <clears throat> rectal uh, endoscopic uh, ultrasound and transvaginal ultrasound. And uh, you can see vaginal ultrasound very, very uh, helpful. And uh, we can see this is an MRI, but we can see what we can also detect uh, by ultrasound. But of course, it needs special training. And uh, in my hospital, and uh, I have specialized in um, the uh, um, surgery of deep infiltrating endometriosis, mainly including bowel and bladder endometriosis, it is very helpful for planning the surgery. And if we have 3D uh, ultrasound and we can sort of have these volumes, then at any time, this can be checked again. Now, for, for all those that want to know more, um, the idea consensus opinion that, that this is an open access uh, publication. So please make a note of this. Uh, you can download this for free. And it is a very helpful uh, presentation, which also has uh, this slide because um, during vaginal ultrasound and also simultaneous palpating, you can see that there are adhesions and you can also detect tender points. So the, the vaginal ultrasound probe is not only the ultrasound, it is also a, uh, a testing uh, stick where you can feel, uh, the, the patient will also describe this is painful, but you can also see are there adhesions and where are the tender points, very, very important. And uh, the same publication also shows um, various um, sites of endometriosis. So please download this um, to, uh, to make sure that you have this, this information available. Now, just a few examples. This is a patient that presented herself with chronic cystitis, infection of a bladder. This was her diagnosis. But during ultrasound, we, we, you know, this is the bladder that is um, a little filled, but we saw this tumor here with good blood supply. This is the Doppler uh, ultrasound. The uterus is very normal. And you can see here, this is all bladder endometriosis. This is endometriosis of the bladder. And this had not been diagnosed because otherwise it would not have grown to such extent. This is a matter of years. As Nijambi was also explaining, it took her years until the disease has, had reached this stage. This is uh, the, the, the sign of kissing ovaries. Kissing is wonderful, but kissing ovaries is not very nice because it says that the entire pelvis is blocked by these huge uh, ovarian endometrioma. If you can see this homogeneous uh, color, this is uh, endometriosis. And we can also see here this, uh, this video. Uh, you can see there is fluid in the pouch of Douglas, which is very common when there is an inflammation. And this was also outlined by Robert. The inflammation is part of the pain. So inflammation uh, does cause pain. And you can see here uh, for differential diagnosis, the Doppler uh, shows that there is no, uh, no Doppler in the, the tumor itself. 
Now, bowel endometriosis, as I said, you know, I specialize myself as a surgeon for bowel, even though I'm a gynecologist, but this is something uh, that we do a lot here in Frankfurt. And you can see this is a nodule in the bowel. This is uh, the uterus, and you can see more uh, of these nodules. This nodule, for instance, which is depicted up here, this nodule is called Diabolo, the, uh, the devil's nodule. It sits in uh, the posterior wall of the uterus. It affects the vagina, the uterus sacral space, and the bowel. And of course, every intercourse for this woman is mm. like hell because it is, it is extremely painful. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, very often it is not being diagnosed, even though it is very, very easy. You can see this is the vaginal probe. This is only two centimeters uh, and this is the nodule. It's uh, an uh, um, hypoechogenic uh, area, and this is endometriosis. Here you can see the surgical site, and you can see this is uh, all fibrous tissue, and this is the endometriosis, but the mucosa is not affected. And this is why GI specialists will not see um, endometriosis. And as they do not palpate uh, from the rectum, they will also not feel it. And I have experienced when I had said there is endometriosis deep infiltrating, they said, no, there is not. And we resected this uh, thick uh, nodule. The next part is adenomyosis. And once again, this is another um, uh, open access publication uh, it shows the Musa consensus. Please download this because it nicely shows if the uterus is um, abnormal, that there is uh, the, the anterior wall is uh, different from the posterior wall. Uh, if you have these patches uh, of uh, hypoechogenic areas which might be um, filled with blood, uh, then uh, this is uh, suspicious for uh, adenomyosis, of course, um, a very nice sign is these radiating uh, signs uh, that can easily be seen, but also interrupted uh, junctional zone. So all is very nice uh, depicted. And uh, sometimes there are several of these signs. And here you can see, this is um, very nice. The anterior wall, sorry, the posterior wall is, um, by far uh, less in diameter than the anterior wall. And uh, you can also see here the radiating signs. Uh, and it is like showing uh, your hands. And you can also explain to the patient, this is very typical for adenomyosis and that probably needs uh, surgery. Um, uh, Osada has described a very nice technique that we are also using. Whatever you do to the pelvis with vaginal ultrasound is very helpful, but don't forget to whether the patient complains or not to also perform a kidney ultrasound because whenever there is endometriosis in the pelvis, it might affect uh, the ureters. And uh, we have seen too many silent kidneys. So when doing pelvic surgery, we also had to remove the kidney. And uh, it is because uh, the endometriosis can compress, it can strangulate the ureter. And uh, the, the patients, when you ask them later on, they would say, oh yeah, I had some back pain, but it was not enough to report to the doctor. So by strangulating uh, the ureters, you will also see that there might be some, uh, some hydronephrosis and that is the right time uh, to perform surgery. Rectal and uh, ultrasound, I will, won't go into detail. MRI is very helpful, but MRI is something that you need to have a dedicated radiologist for because the procedure has to be standardized and the radiologist has to be interested in, in endometriosis and adenomyosis because otherwise you will have a specialist that is not specialist in endometriosis and won't give you adequate results. We have standardized the procedure 
if anyone wants to have this publication, I can hand it to, to Dr. Uh, Yomi Abayi and he can distribute this. This is of course also for free, but it is, you know, if you wanna have it as PDF, um, you probably will have to pay, but I will give it to you if you like. So uh, this has to be asked. Now, once you have someone that is good in, in MRI, you can also see here, there is an endometriosis in the scar of C-section. And we have to note that C-section sometimes is a stimulus to endometriosis. This, of course, is in the scar. And you can see here, this is the fascia of the rectus muscle, but this is on top and it involves, and it involves the scar. But we also know that, for instance, endometriosis of the brain is following C-section after two, three years. The same I've experienced with lung uh, endometriosis. It followed uh, C-section after some, some years, two, three years. Uh, and I do not know whether Nijambi had a C-section, so, but that would be interesting to find out if there had been a time lag uh, to this. When we compare these methods, we have to see that the inspection with speculum doesn't help with peritoneal endometriosis, not with ovarian endometriosis, but deep infiltrating endometriosis, when you can see it in the posterior fornix at the end of the vagina, then uh, it is, this is absolutely clear. Then this is uh, indicative of deep infiltrating endometriosis. Palpation, peritoneal endometriosis only if there is pain, uh, ovarian endometriosis if you perform uh, in uh, rectal vaginal examination, you can feel, and of course, bowel endometriosis. Uh, my fingers are about uh, eight, nine centimeters. That far is what I can feel, and that is 100% if there is a nodule. This is always endometriosis, even mm. though gastroenterologists might not have uh, uh, come to the same conclusion. Ultrasound does not help uh, with peritoneal endometriosis and not MRI but with ovarian endometriosis, with deep infiltrating endometriosis. And laparoscopy, of course, is uh, the gold standard for peritoneal endometriosis, but also for endometriomas uh, of the ovary and for deep infiltrating endometriosis. But it has also been overlooked, and this is why one needs to have a specialist. And I would be more than happy to share my own experience uh, with you uh, in Nigeria or in all of Africa, because African women should not travel anywhere else, but they should be treated and diagnosed in Africa and not, not anywhere else. We know, and this is worldwide, there is an unacceptable average in delay. And this is for women that suffer from endometriosis. And when, as part of the endometriosis, uh, uh, workup, uh, um, uh, a laparoscopy is being performed, then of course the endometriosis is apparent. Women with deep infiltrating endometriosis, th this is another study by Hudelist, might take up to 11 years until deep infiltrating endometriosis is being detected. And those cases like Nijambi has uh, um, mentioned, but I have many other examples, this would be another lecture, it takes even longer than that, and this is not acceptable. Basically, everything that is uh, regular in following the menses first has to be regarded as endometriosis. I will skip this because it's, this had been mentioned. And when we see uh, these slides uh, from uh, laparoscopy, we can see here, this is white light laparoscopy. This is um, an implant that because it is not black, uh, a lot of people might overlook, but you can see there are vessels and this is what is called neovascularization. There is formation of new vessels with um, a narrow band imaging, which with this green light, this is even better to be seen. And this will also underline that uh, lymphokines, chemokines do not only evoke neoangiogenesis, but also uh, neo neurogenesis there is and this is this is uh, probably sarcastic to say endometriosis creates its own nerves and therefore can even cause pain in a much better way than than if it would not work in this way uh, the release of uh, chemokines causes nerves to migrate uh, to this site 
and uh, be painful. We have different entities. This is peritoneal, you've seen this. This is endometrioma, and this is deep infiltrating endometrioma. This is uh, an extreme case where, you, where everybody must see, but we also have other cases where there is deep infiltrating endometriosis, but it is still overlooked. And this is why the person that does the surgery should also have uh, uh, um, uh, um, examine the patient. This is something which is very interesting because I have always been said this doesn't exist. I have seen it several times. This is endometriosis of the tube. You can see the tube is thick and swollen. And this endometriosis has migrated from the lumen through uh, the wall and uh, thereby caused infertility because this tube uh, is impassable. This is another entity, and this is so-called frozen pelvis. As we mentioned before, endometriosis is a chronic inflammation, and inflammation in some uh, patients will cause adhesions. So this, uh, this pelvis is full of adhesions, and I can only advise those that want to do the surgery, start in uh, the healthy tissue and my, and, and walk your way to this, to this um, uh, area and only then you, you can have a success in doing the surgery. I might start a, a small video. This might be interesting because you can see this is the bowel. This is a small bowel endometriosis and we did uh, um, an uh, uh, excision and uh, anastomosis by endoscopy in this uh, patient with small bowel. But the main reason to show this is as it underlines what the old gynecologists have uh, uh, speculated, mainly Samson, but uh, also Rocky Tansky, this, this is retrograde menstruation. You can see the blood in the pouch of Douglas. Um, when there is retrograde menstruation, that uh, means there is dysperistalsis of, of the uterus. So the uterus is like a pump and it does not pump the blood through the vagina, but through the tubes. And whenever blood enters the abdominal cavity, there is a signal of, um, of, uh, of danger in the abdomen, and this will cause pain, no matter whether endometriosis had been established already or not. And this is something that, uh, that also a gynecologist can see, because uh, if um, this is shown during vaginal ultrasound, then uh, we will easily see that this is not fluid uh, like water, it is blood that there is in the, the pouch of ductus, and uh, it is usually also associated with endometriosis, but uh, retrograde menstruation is bad enough. Now talking about bladder endometriosis, which I think is very, very important because these women are very often misdiagnosed and mistreated as cystitis, as an infection of the bladder. And uh, finally, they might run into uh, a resistance um, of bacteria to any uh, antibiotic that is given. And this is uh, only a mild finding during cystoscopy by urologists but this is the endoscopic finding. And uh, the same is with this case. This is what we can, can see during laparoscopy. This is not very um, massive finding, but this should be excised and not just coagulated. What some surgeon, at least in Germany, they won't have an easy life. They, they just coagulate this. But when you excise, as you can see, there is a huge nodule here. We open uh, the bladder, we close the, the bladder, but we have to obey, of course, that this patient has to go with her catheter for, let's say, two weeks. So in order to allow the bladder to heal, and normally the bladder does not have any problem to heal. When um, a laparoscopy is being performed, it has to follow a circle so that we inspect everything. We have to uh, inspect the vesico-uterine fold. We have to see the round ligament, uh, the tube, the ovary, the ovarian fossa, the uterosacral ligament, where there are usually a lot of endometriosis mm. in the pouch of Douglas. And uh, my, my previous teacher, Professor Zem, who is one of the pioneers of endoscopic surgery, had divided uh, this very simple classification 
but uh, it was not used because there is uh, the difference between two and three is not fine. So that's why we have a classification of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, um, which um, uh, you can sort of uh, attach to uh, the, the place where you uh, write the, the medical report during uh, surgery. Um, and you can also have for infertility patients the endometriosis fertility index by David Adamson, um, which uh, is a bit um, smart because it also involves uh, historical data like duration of um, infertility um, so that there is no relation to endometriosis. But uh, the good thing is you can give your patients an estimation how, how likely they will be uh, to uh, have uh, uh, a pregnancy. And when you end up down here, you better say, uh, think about um, uh, the procedures, um, but you might not have a pregnancy. Now in Europe, uh, we have um, designed a, a classification just for deep infiltrating endometriosis, which follows the TNM classification for tumors. This is the version of 2011, and this had been um, extended to the hashtag NCM classification. And I would be happy if you would sort of copy this in order to think about it, because it gives a full representation of, uh, of this, um, because you have these compartments as you had in the uh, the 2011 edition. This is uterus sacral, uh, um, uh, recovaginal space, vagina, and cul de sac. This is uterus sacral ligaments, cardinal ligament, pelvic sidewall, and this is the rectum up to there. But it also has distant areas like adenomyosis, bladder endometriosis, and intestinal endometriosis, as this case of uh, small bowel endometriosis, and also intrinsic. Um, endometriosis of the urethra because most of these uh, urethral endometriosis, they are um, endometriosis coming from the uteral sacral ligament, but not uh, um, intrinsic endometriosis. And of course, the distant location, diaphragma, lung, nerves, uh, brain, uh, skin, I have one in the ear, in the femoral artery, so, endometriosis can be everywhere, but we have to think about it. And of course, uh, mainly for um, uh, to complete, there is the peritoneum, the ovary, and the tubo ovarian condition, also functional parameters like adhesions, motility, and patency tests. So this is the end of my lecture uh, concerning, uh, concerning the uh, um, concerning uh, the locations and the classification. And um, to demonstrate how happy I am to be with you today, um, I think that uh, you are the right forum to give endometriosis a voice. You have wonderful and excellent, I'm, I'm talking about Mrs. Etim, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And also Mrs. Nijambi, that you are helping to advocate this because it is not only a matter of doctors. All members of society have to know and have to accept that there is endometriosis because only when forces can be joined, this can help to make life easier for women and adolescents with this disease. And that's why I'm really grateful to be here with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hans Rudolf Tinberg. Um, you helped us to realize that we went crazy when we complained that we were hurting and people should, you know, listen to their patients when they complain because it is not particularly something that we dream about. It's literally happening. So thank you so much for sharing and also agreeing to share your your knowledge with everybody. And we're very thankful to all the panelists for coming here. And I know there's still going to be a vote of thanks, but I'm saying thank you because this has helped people like myself who are here to, to understand that endometriosis is a disease that everyone must talk about. Mm -hmm. I've got a few questions. I'm sorry I can't take all the questions. And I, I hope you do understand that we are pressed for time. I will take a few. 
that I have here and I'll throw it out and whoever wants to answer can answer. Um, any of the doctors, obviously. Um, this is from Theodora. And she says, as an endometriosis and adenomyosis warrior, I know how expensive treatment can get. I recently tried to get personal health insurance because I left my job where I had premium health cover. I was perfectly informed that I have to use personal health cover for a year before I can receive treatment for endometriosis and adenomyosis. As someone who only ever goes to the hospital, because of these conditions, how will the foundation help in that regard? We do need health insurance companies to give exceptions to suffering of endometriosis and adenomyosis. So I think this is for Dr. Abayomi. You, you, you hardly hear you. Are you kidding? No. I'm sorry. Oh, bless. I, oh, I apologize, but what's wrong with my network then? Sorry, let me just have someone check it. Did I, I didn't do anything. I don't think it's you. Well, was it only me? Oh, no. Maybe it was. Did everyone else hear me, please? Mm. Well, if I may say, it was difficult to understand because it was sort of like it being chopped up. Um, but I think um, the adenomyosis, um, it is important to differentiate whether uh, this uh, lady wants to have children or not. So um, if there is still the wish to conceive, of course, uh, it is very important to, uh, to uh, keep the uterus uh, in a functional state. And I mentioned briefly that uh, there are certain surgical techniques which can reconstitute the uterus. And I had gigantic uh, uteri due to adenomyosis that were reduced to a normal size and women conceive. Um, on the other hand, uh, if they do not want to conceive, one can, of course, remove the uterus. But um, it is quite effective to have the Mirena or um, in Japan, uh, there, is, uh, there are other um, um, uh, inserts into the uterine cavity, which can help to to uh, decrease um, the the adenomyosis. Thank you so much, Professor. So um, I have another question here from Abosade Grace. This is from Facebook. She says endometriosis of the lungs that has caused reoccurring oocytes and has been placed on GNR. Age therapy and ATV drugs, but still the fluid is still accumulating. Please, doctors, what can be done to be free from this? Thank you. What? Uh, okay, Hans. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to answer. Thank so, you. So, um, if, of course, in in Thank any you. extensive case of endometriosis. I would advocate surgery because still surgery in endometriosis is the gold standard. Unfortunately, uh, there are also some endometriosis uh, implants or deep infiltrating tumors of endometriosis that do not respond to any form of treatment. Now, <clears throat> when uh, it is uh, the building up of fluid, of course, this can be drained, but I think a surgery uh, is the must, and we could also see with Njambi that this was helpful. But then consecutively, I think one should consult perhaps an endocrinologist that, uh, like Dr. Uh, Yomi um, to help um, find to, to stabilize this. And of course, uh, gestogens like Dianogis are quite helpful. There is um, a new um, study underway where um, other drugs are being tested like uh, um, complementary drugs uh, uh, like uh, uh, curcuma, uh, cumin, um, because it is anti-inflammatory. And if one can control the inflammation, that might already help to, uh, to reduce the effect of the endometriosis or adenomyosis. I think adding to what uh, Dr. Tina Berg uh, said, and it's important for everybody to, I think, understand this. Um, in cases of severe endometriosis with deep infiltrating lesions and widespread disease, there really at the, car at the present time is no 
medical therapy that can address those uh, problems. That surgery in those cases is primary and that maintenance therapy after that is helpful. Now, in some cases, uh, preoperative treatment to reduce the inflama inflammatory response is indicated to optimize the effectiveness of surgery. But at a certain point, only surgery will, will really take care of the endometriosis. There are currently no drugs, not immunological, not anti-inflammatory, not uh, endocrinological, that really can take care of the uh, lesions that, uh, that Dr. Tinneberg showed uh, on rectal exam uh, with or on ultrasound that are in a deep infiltrating endometriosis. And uh, do you agree with that, Hans? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And in Africa, uh, unfortunately, the greatest uh, exponent of that was Hans van der Vaat in, uh, in South Africa, who passed away a couple of years ago. And he was one of the leaders in uh, that kind of endometriosis and diagnosis, which is, uh, I got a question earlier about what to do in women who can't have a pelvic exam, either they're adolescents uh, or they are of a religious uh, affiliation that nobody can do a pelvic exam or a vag vaginal exam uh, uh, to uh, disrupt their virginity until marriage. And so those are challenges. But uh, Dr. Tinneberg showed very many good op options for it, rectal endometriosis, abdominal uh, exams, or MRI, where MRI is available. But uh, just about anybody has the rectal uh, probe available to somebody that knows what they're doing. So again, it's uh, the allocation of resources, but also realistic expectations. Thank you. I, to something to that, that, um, I think back to what Ngabi said about having um, many doctors coming together to treat endometriosis. Because if you have thoracic endometriosis, that, that means you're talking about the cardiothoracic surgeon being involved. Yeah. And um, just like um, uh, Hans said, that they might drain such um, fluid accumulation. And sometimes they have to fuse. You know, so I think uh, it's, uh, but that's, it's one problem, I think, uh, because I've been involved in some of these cases and you know that it, they're really very, unless very extreme cases, you don't want to fuse the plural space, but sometimes they, they have to do that. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's a call also for, for us to have other specialists also being involved with the treatment of some of these patients. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. Um, I've got one last question. Um, a woman with stage four endometriosis, spots of endometriosis between the bladder, lungs, uterus, with an extensive rectus sigmoid endometriosis, has had three laparotomies, I hope I pronounced it right, to break down adhesion and myomectomy, was started on Zoladex for six months, had three failed IVFs. Question one. What would be the best way to achieve pregnancy with the above history? Second question, how can severe pain and constant flare-ups be managed in possible treatments? I, I guess because I do IVF, I'll probably have a go at the fertility bit. Okay. Sometimes the problem is that a patient has infertility and has pain. And... Um, because we know that medical therapy for endometriosis, with uh, maybe for pain, will not make her pregnant. And so that's where what Hans said also initially and what uh, Robert said, that surgery might be useful in some of them. But for this particular patient, I think that is, she has stage four and uh, she's had um, how many, three laparotomies? Three, yes. Yeah. I think IVF would still be, and she had some failed IVFs, but IVF would just probably, she still probably would need IVF. And then um, the question would be, what is that? What, how old is she? Uh, because sometimes you see some of the patients who are 43 and she has endometriosis and then she's using her eggs. So there's some decisions that we probably might need to, to make. So it's to have a full story for, the fertility bit, but I think um, either Hans or uh, Rob will talk about the pain 
but I, I just spoke about it a little bit. Yeah, well, <clears throat> as you know, Yomi, I'm also a reproductive specialist. So from that point of view, I, I fully support what you're saying, but would like to point out if uh, the uh, deep infiltrating endometriosis is still around, mm -hmm. then of course, uh, this should be removed because there are quite a number of studies showing that uh, the, and I think this is um, associated with the, the chronic inflammation that the, the disease has to be removed. And if there's a rectal sigmoidal endometriosis, that, that should be removed. And it would also remove the tubes and uh, to make sure that there is no significant adenomyosis. A mild adenomyosis, which is endometriosis in the uterus, doesn't matter. But a severe adenomyosis does count. And I do not know your regulations, perhaps, if she is a little older, as uh, Yomi mentioned, uh, perhaps uh, she should also think of oversight donation. That's a great explanation. I would just like to add one thing to that, since we're a good uh, team, is that uh, in a woman who's had several surgeries like this, um, more surgery, even if you do more surgery, we do really need to evaluate the uterus itself, uh, because if she does have extensive adenomyosis, there are going to be local factors that are going to involve the ability for implantation and uh, inflammation that will affect the, the well-being of the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So uh, many times you can, um, well, it's important to optimize the actual uterine environment itself. If she has endometriosis of the intestines or the bladder, whatever, that still will cause systemic effects, but it won't help her get the pregnancy until uh, we make sure that if she does become pregnant by IVF implantation or oocyte donation, that, uh, that it, it will successfully implant and grow and won't miscarry. Because as we know, in, endometriosis itself will, will have an increased incidence of miscarriage. I will tell you the story about my um, sister's, I guess, middle daughter now, uh, who is, uh, how much old is she? How old is she now? 51. And uh, she had a very successful, um, at the age of 48, uh, sperm and oocyte donation, and now has a very nice four-year-old daughter. Uh, and she, she had lost ovary and a bunch of problems. So I want to encourage the women who do have endometriosis and fertility problems, that when it's adequately uh, diagnosed and managed by somebody like you, Yomi, or Hans, that uh, they still have options, but that they have to be willing to undergo a serious uh, evaluation and consider surgery when necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rob. Um, well, I think that's all for the questions that we can take today. I'm hoping that, again, we can have a forum like this where we can all come together and learn from the wealth of um, knowledge that's in here in this space. But then they say that dance is important. And we, I don't know where Mabel is, but somehow her internet connectivity is bad. So, but we will bring to your viewing pleasure the end of dance. It's a piece of choreography which is put together by the endometriosis support group Nigeria as part of its as part of its drive to raise awareness amongst our youth and the audience generally about endometriosis. They say that dance is a great tool and it's also able to capture the attention of the youth and of course it's African. So please join us and enjoy this dance. <laughs> You know you got me going. 
much to the face of endometriosis for doing this. Um, I almost started dancing, but I remember that I had to just listen to the goodwill messages that were going to come forth from Ghana, Botswana, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. But just before they give us their goodwill messages, we'd like to tell the participants to download a booklet on endometriosis provided by Inters Pharmaceuticals. It's right there. So we'd have a message from Ghana, and I'm thinking that would be Farida Brody. You're on mute. Yes. Hello, Farida. <laughs> um, the good one message will be delivered by Billy Convian. He's a secretary. So, Billy, can you go ahead, please? All right. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Yeah, oh, we okay. can hear you. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm Billy Combien. I'll be reading the Goodwill message on behalf of Endometriosis Foundation Ghana. Uh, so a uh, Goodwill message from Endometriosis Foundation Ghana. Endometriosis Foundation Ghana is very excited to be part of a bigger platform that is championing the drive to increase advocacy and awareness on endometriosis and also changing the narrative for women living with a condition. Uh, since we established four years ago, we have successfully triggered several conversations, awareness creation and advocacy about endometriosis. Um, this we've done through endro matches, uh, community outreaches, uh, social media education, radio and television programs. Well, nonetheless, these successes were fragged with um, some challenges, such as inadequate research, uh, which we've highlighted. Uh, um, our uh, our webinar. Um, also, we have a peculiar challenge is the public perce perception about women's pain, um, culture, and also inadequate funding. But we've been resolved with our vision. And um, as co-founders of African Endometriosis Awareness and Support Group, we hope more endometriosis foundations across Africa get on board and unite uh, on this great platform which we've created. And so we at EFG Ghana uh, will do our bit to foster this bond that we have built and make it greater. Cheers to Africa Endometriosis and Support Group. And uh, we want to say, may all our dreams come true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, would like to get the goodwill message from Kenya. And that would be, I can't find her name. That would be Elsie Wandera. I hope I got that right. Thank you, Nse. Um, I hope I also got your name right. Um, 
it's a very good pleasure to just be here and representing uh, East Africa. Uh, Jambi, it's great to see you and a very inspirational voice. Uh, of course, you know you really inspire a lot of young women in the country um, through your story. Again, thank you everyone, um, and especially Dr. Ajayi for just uh, mobilizing the rest of us to participate in this, um, in lending a voice to the global efforts um, in raising awareness and especially putting Africa on the map. I think great presentations um, from everyone in terms of just the extent and the impact of endometriosis on women and the efforts around just ensuring that we um, we improve diagnosis and just ensure that, you know, um, the women who are suffering get a voice and a platform um, where we can validate their pain and ensure that they do not feel um, sidelined um, when it comes to career, etc. Um, I think for me, it's interesting, um, you know, in terms of what we do as the Endometriosis Foundation of Kenya, of course, is ensuring that we raise awareness about the, the, the condition um, here in Kenya and, and just make sure that, you know, um, there's a platform and a space for women to come and be vulnerable and share their challenges uh, and as well point them to specialists, um, even just outside the country uh, and ensure that they get the adequate, adequate care. Um, I think one of the things that we would love to push um, and in collaboration with yourselves is try and, you know, just to try and see how we can influence workplace policy. I think kudos to our Zambian counterparts. The country I think is one of the first in Africa to um, implement uh, the menstrual leave and that's wonderful. Um, I think for us, it's just making sure that women get equal access to healthcare um, because we do know that it's unaffordable here in Africa just to even get surgery. We've had stories about insurance, um, you know, et cetera. But I think um, ensuring one, that the workplace is conducive for endometriosis warriors, I think is a big uh, uh, role that we can also play in ensuring that, you know, the women who are going through this pain um, have the support. But this was an absolutely excellent um, initiative uh, by yourselves. And we look forward to collaborating and working together in ensuring that we definitely put Africa on the map and demonstrate that, you know what, we can come up with solutions and we are helping our women and girls. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elsie. Um, Tinny, are you ready? Hi. So Tinny is going to give us a goodwill message from Zimbabwe. We can't hear you. Hi guys. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Hi everyone. My name is Tine Rimbo and I am from the amazing Zimbabwe. I am speaking on behalf of the Zimbabwean organizations that are advocating for endometriosis. So that is the Zimbabwe Endometriosis Support Network, which I lead and I'm the founder of. And there's also the Zimbabwe Endometriosis Chapter, which is led by Nadia Esof. So, I mean, on our side, um, I'm an endometriosis champion and I'm also a menstrual health expert. And I think one of the most important things is just getting down to the basics. Um, awareness, which we're all doing, but also just trying to get people to understand why awareness is important to understand that women's health is important. And as everyone has been echoing that it's not just a period, it affects our health, our mental health, our physical health, it, it affects our careers, it affects our relationships with people, it affects ourselves as a whole. And I think for us, um, we are just so excited to be a part of this. We're so excited to have a collective voice. I think that's something that was really missing and to have something very unique as Africans as well. There's so many endometriosis organizations, but it's so great to have an authentic African collective voice, which is what we've just started today. Um, we are so excited again about being a part of this. We promise to do our level best to add value where we can. And um, I just wanted to finish off with a quote that I really like that says, the greatness of community is most accurately measured by compassionate actions of its members. 
and that is us. This is what we're doing. It's been a pleasure to meet you all. It's been a pleasure to hear from you and I'm excited to see what comes out of this. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask if Botswana is ready. Dr. Tumi Umfusu, did I get that right? Is she here? Hi. Hi. I <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Can yeah. you guys hear me? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much. This the presentations were absolutely, absolutely amazing. Like I haven't been excited like this for such a long time. Um, listening to experts around the world sharing, you know, their views on what they're going through. It's really amazing to see the innovative ideas out there. And I'm just so excited to want I want some more basically. But yeah, as from Botswana, I am talking on behalf of our endometriosis foundation for Homotompo Kahosi. She's not feeling well. So I'll be here for her. Um, as you said, my name is Dr. Tumi Mpustu um, from Botswana. I currently work in the OBS and Gynae department. And for me, as a young doctor working government facilities in the Gynae department, seeing how most ladies do come with, you know, your typical chronic pains, your irregular bleeding, and there's not much we can do for them. As government, there's not much we can do for them. And you always have that stigma telling ladies, but it's just periods, it's just normal. And I won't lie, even myself as a doctor, um, I didn't understand the complexity of endometriosis until it actually hit me. And it, when it hit me, it really hit me hard. I'm an endometriosis stage three activist, plus I have diffuse adenomyosis. So now understanding this disease from not other as a doctor, but also as a patient and as a sister, you know, now I'm well-rounded. I understand the pain, you know, we all go through. It pushed us as the foundation. Once I reached out to the foundation, it pushed us to, to educate people more. Um, and, to, and our education is not to, you know, to scare people away. That was our big problem here in Botswana was a lot of ladies or parents are like, oh my goodness, my child is doomed. We're like, no, no, no. You can have it, but you can also live happily. There's so many ladies doing it. So this is us trying to come together because you're not alone. So yeah, so we did a lot of education through our walks, through um, talking at the clinics, um, especially in the peripheries where a lot of ladies don't have access to internet. So us going on you know, social media, like us being privileged here, they don't have this access. So we go out to the clinics and educate in the high schools, even as low as your primary schools, because it starts very young and um, radio shows as well. So yeah, we continue doing that as well. Um, we try to put entertainment as long with it as well. You know, just you guys showed our da uh, that beautiful dance and here in Botswana, we love, love, love dancing. So yeah, um, dance was something that slowed down when I got diagnosed, but now I'm getting my strength back and I'm learning how to live with it and embrace it and accept it that, you know, now I'm dancing again. And, and it's a way people can see us pushing through that they're like, actually, you know what? It's not the end. So we're literally just here trying to tell people, you know, ladies all around, you're not crazy. You're not crazy and you're not alone. And we're here to love you. And having places like this where we can talk and express and learn and grow and teach some more is absolutely amazing. So from Botswana, thank you. We 100% support every single foundation out there. And I cannot wait for more. Once COVID comes down, I cannot wait to see the projects that come out. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I saved the best for last. Um, normally, oh, there she goes. She's smiling. So <laughs> yeah. the goodwill message from Kafilwe Nchabele, South Africa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Um, I am Kifilwe Nchabele, one of the directors for Endo Warriors SA which is a non-profit support group that was founded in uh, 2014 by one of our fellow sisters, uh, Rochelle. Um, we do support uh, ladies that are living with endometriosis and we do create awareness through doing, um, we do walks 
um, every year, except for this year, yeah, because of the end, uh, because of the COVID, and we've been educating girls, young and old, in schools, radio interviews, um, TV interviews, and um, we we have uh, uh, what you call we've got. Um, Facebook as well as a, a WhatsApp group that we we giving um, a platform for ladies to share their experiences daily, to answer questions and ask questions where they can. Um, we also focusing on the current science based approaches to help ladies uh, improve their quality of life. So yeah. We are actually very much excited to be part of this um, very good initiative by Dr. Abeomi. Thank you again for inviting me. Uh, so yeah, we can't wait, we can't wait. I was actually looking forward to coming to Lagos and unfortunately. <laughs> so I hope once the COVID is done, we're all gonna be meeting in one room and we can actually share, shake hands and share a drink. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And since we can't all, um, we can't, because normally in unveiling the Africa Endo Creed, normally all of us would scrim it out together. So I'm probably just going to read it out. And so would bear, bear with me. I mean, I'm the one who's saying this now. So the Africa Endometriosis Foundation, this is the creed, our creed. We, the one in 10 African sisters, do solemnly affirm. We can all say it. Yay, it's on the screen. Yes. So should we all say it together? <laughs> yeah, it's more fun. Including yeah. the men? Yes. yes. You have to be feminist too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> one. Two, three, go. We are the one in ten. We the one in ten. Let me affirm. We will be at the forefront of information. We will use our experiences to help for the success of the past. The American psychological impact on themselves and the community. We support all we will always be there to support sisters like ourselves. Just like ourselves. As they, they go through the challenges and the This week, we affirm this, this day, this 27th June 2020. This will affirm to the state of the community. Yay! All right. Yay. Thank you so much, everybody. But would like Farida Barbie to give us the vote of thanks. Sorry, I mixed that up earlier on. That's fine. Thank you so much, Inze. I must say I'm starstruck and I applaud you <laughs> for um, what you've done for yourself and for other women. And um, I don't know if I could just make it wow. It was a, it was a great presentation. I don't, I, I, I don't know. Well, let me, just, let me just say what I prepared. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the African Endometriosis Awareness Foundation, we want to thank you for taking our time to be part of this groundbreaking event. We want to thank our special guest, Professor Ireti Akinola and Professor Isaac Adewole for their wonderful presentation, especially highlighting, you know, um, our African perspective. And also Dr. Ajayi, Dr. Yomi Ajayi, for you know, bringing to bear what we are going through in Africa, and also to our international um, presenters, Dr. Robert Zuwari and Dr. Hans Rudolf Tenebeck, we, we want to say a big thank you. To our sponsors, Intas, we are extremely grateful, and we hope you keep sponsoring 
other events that are more to come. And we hope you continue to support all our, our, our organizations henceforth. And special thanks to our co-founders, Ghana, Botswana, Nigeria, for making this possible and to our wonderful host. I think I started with you. Thank you so much. And also to the, organizer, uh, the organizers for this event, it's been very amazing and great. And I believe together, we will change the narrative. If we haven't, we've actually started changing the narrative about endometriosis in Africa. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, it was lovely to meet you all. I can now be crazy. And, <laughs> bye. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Enjoy your enjoy. And Nadia, if you are here, please get well soon. And Jambi, yeah, I also have thoracic endometriosis, I think I told you. Thank you so much. I mean, at least I hope someone feels what I also go through. And to you, Enze, I mean, okay, Isa should stop, okay. Our, oh, <laughs> All right then. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.